Good morning, everybody. On behalf of the Starkloft Disability Institute, I want to welcome everyone to our presentation today, Reporting on Disability with Dignity. My name is Dallas Adams, and I am the Communications Coordinator at Starkloft. I am honored to MC our event today. We have so much great information to share with you. Before we get started, I want to go over some of the technical aspects of this event and tell you a little bit about Starkloft Disability Institute. This webinar is being recorded and will be distributed to all attendees and registrants following the presentation. Please note that captioning and interpreting services are available throughout this presentation. If you need to access either of these features, please refer to the guide that was sent via email prior to this event. We will also be actively monitoring the Q&A and chat box, so please don't hesitate to ask your questions or say hello as the need arises. If you see a question from someone else that you would like to be answered, give it an upvote and we will prioritize it for our Q&A portion of this presentation. The Starkloft Disability Institute works to create a world that welcomes people with disabilities through pathways to employment, education, and universal access. July is Disability Pride Month and we will celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act on the 26th. Our campaign this year is Diversity Includes Disability. This campaign was developed to advance local and national conversations that explore how the many identities a person has, such as disability, race, gender, and socioeconomic status, interact to shape their experiences in the world. You can learn more and register for upcoming events at starkloft.org slash ADA30. Today's webinar is presented to you by myself, our Chief Operating Officer and Director of Communications, Lori Becker, and Steve Belsch, our Director of Disability Studies. Prior to taking on the role of COO in 2016, Lori Becker served as SDI's Director of Development and Communications. She has 18 years of experience in public relations, community engagement, and political campaign strategy. Lori has a condition called Stargardt's disease that caused her to become legally blind at age 15. She is a Starkloff Career Academy alumna of the class of 2013 and subsequently joined the SDI staff to pursue the organization's mission to challenge ableism and advance opportunities for people with disabilities. Lori is a board member of the Association of Fundraising Professionals, Leadership St. Louis, the Spanish American Girl Society, and a founding member of Festibility, a celebration of disabilities, which is happening virtually this year on the 26th. Steve Felsch is the Director of Disability Studies at Starkloff Disability Institute. He is also as Disability Studies Professor at Maryville University. Steve has decades of experience in the history of the disability rights movement and the political and economic effects of disability. Steve became quadriplegic due to a motorcycle accident in 1985 when he was 20 years old. He joined the SEI staff after meeting our founder, Colleen Starkloff in 2003, and helped found the Disability Studies Program at Maryville University. Steve also serves as a commissioner to the St. Louis Affordable Housing Commission. Welcome to you both, Lori and Steve. Good to morning. open our presentation, I want to briefly talk about disability and why we at SDI proudly use the word disability with a capital D. <clears throat> people with disabilities include people of all genders, races, and socioeconomic backgrounds. There are 61 million people in the United States, one in four adults have a disability, and it is the largest minority group in our country. Disabilities can be temporary or permanent, visible or non-visible, and they can be from birth or acquired throughout a lifetime. You may be interacting with somebody every day who has an invisible or undisclosed disability. People with disabilities are highly capable resilient, creative, innovative, and desire inclusion and opportunities just like everyone else. Disability is not a dirty word and we proudly encourage you all to get, to get comfortable with it. Now I would like to turn our presentation over to Lori Becker who will dive deeper into why the words we use matter. Lori? Thank you, Dallas. Um, thank you all for attending today. Um, great to have everybody here. Um, I am going, uh, you might see me um, live on camera and occasionally I might be turning it off because I might be leaning into my screen to read my notes. So I uh, just wanna let you know what's happening there. So um, we're gonna start off um, by talking about, uh, lay some foundational information about uh, disability itself. Um, 
So we're just going to start off with the basic definition of disability um, by the U.S. government, um, and that defines disability as um, a, uh, a significant impairment, uh, physical or mental, in uh, major life activities. And this could include caring for oneself, it could include um, performing tasks, walking, talking, seeing, hearing, breathing, um, working, uh, learning and working. Um, and these can be both temporary or permanent, and both of those are covered by the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, types and prevalence, um, th this next chart is on um, kind of the amount of individuals throughout the United States um, and the uh, people who have disabilities. You'll see the largest category is ambulatory disabilities, um, followed by hearing and then vision. Um, many people as they age experience um, hear ambulatory hearing and um, vision disabilities. Um, now we just want to go over some just some key concepts that are important in the disability community. Um, we believe that these will definitely give you um, a really strong foundation as um, you do some uh, reporting or storytelling about the disability community. So the first concept is accessibility. Um, accessible describes the nature of accommodations for people who have a disability. And this can be in a physical space, like buildings or venues or parking spaces or restrooms, or even digital platforms like websites or communications or software. Accessible also describes products and services. So you should say the word accessible like accessible parking spaces rather than handicapped parking or disabled rest restrooms. Handicap, um, that word has a negative connotation because it suggests that the barriers to participation um, are in the person with a disability rather than in the environment itself. Um, the next concept we wanna talk about is advocacy or self-advocacy. And this is an active process um, that it is, um, it, this process is designed to make institutions and social and political systems more responsive to the civil rights and the needs and the choices of individuals with disabilities. So through this process, individuals and groups um, advocate um, and they can communicate their rights under various civil rights legislations and with their ability to participate in the decisions that have an effect on themselves. So many people with disabilities, including myself, call themselves self-advocates. The next concept is a consumer. Um, Consumer is a term used by many in the disability community to refer to someone with a disability. And the reason this is, is because the civil rights movement in the United States inspired the independent living movement in the 1970s, which maintains that people with disabilities are consumers of assistive services, and they have a responsibility to evaluate and control those services. Um, so you see this picture here. This is actually of Steve and one of his employees who he hires and may, he maintains um, a, a number of employees uh, you know, that he hires. So he is the consumer of those services. Um, and on a similar note, um, some people often refer to uh, or want to be described by what they use, such as a wheelchair user or a ventilator user. Um, independent living is another a very important concept that we just talked about. And this refers to, this is actually the philosophy that people with disabilities should be able to make their own decisions that affect their own lives. Now, this seems like a pretty basic concept, but even today, um, some people do believe that individuals with disabilities cannot make their own decisions. Um, 
and I know that there are some people um, on the call today who um, work at independent living centers, and I want to thank you for joining us. Um, you guys um, do extremely important work in our community. So independent living um, also refers to um, a civil rights movement um, that advocates for equal participation in community life. Um, and this is a service system that is made up of these centers for independent living. And their role is these are non-residential resource centers throughout the country. Um, and they are run by and for people with disabilities and as well as for the benefit of the entire community. And their core services include advocacy, information and referral, independent living skills training, peer counseling, um, and um, also deinstitutionalization of people with disabilities. Steve, have I missed anything yet? Um, no, I just, I just, one I'd like, can we go back to uh, to uh, consumer for a second? Sure. The, one slide back. Yeah, I just, I would just like to say that I am, I am not a patient, I am a consumer. And the whole idea behind consumer directed services is that people with disabilities are, the, are some of the best authorities of what they need and when they need it. When I first got hurt, I had a doctor prescribe that I would have a nurse come out to my house for four hours, Monday through Friday. Well, I don't need four hours of work. Uh, Monday through Friday, and then just to lay in bed, or I could be the, expect to be not to be disabled on Saturday and Sunday. But when I'm, at, but me as a consumer, I'm in charge of everything. I'm in charge of of advertising for. It. I'm in charge of uh, interviewing. I'm in charge of uh, training people. I'm in charge of scheduling them. I am in complete control of the services. And I would like to also point out when we talk about the medical model and social model later, I'd like to point out that these services, me living in my house and, and me hiring the people that I want to give the keys to my apartment to come in and work for me, this, these services cost about 40 to 60% less than me being in a nursing home. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of passionate about it. I'm sorry. No, thanks. You no, know, Steve, thank you so much. That's exactly, um, exactly right. Um, so um, another key concept um, that you'll hear a lot about when you are um, covering stories um, about um, people with disabilities is inclusion. Um, and you know, inclusion perhaps is best known for its role in the public school system, um, you know, in integration of students with disabilities in mainstream classrooms, um, though this concept has a much uh, wider significance. It means that people with disabilities are considered full citizens with equal opportunity to participate in community life. Um, as the, and as the largest minority group in the United States, people with disabilities should also be included in conversations about diversity. Um, a lot of times, you know, diversity and inclusion um, seem to, uh, you know, be talked about simultaneously, especially in the corporate world, um, but people with disabilities aren't always part of that conversation. The Next concept, um, extremely important one that Steve just mentioned is uh, the medical model versus the social model of disability. The medical model is an attitude and a practice that regards disability as a defect um, or a sickness that must be cured or normalized through medical intervention. And people in the disability community prefer the social or the independent living model, which regards disability as a neutral difference that is to be acknowledged um, between people. And that people with disabilities can be healthy. In the social model, problems related to disability 
are caused by the interaction between the individual and the environment rather than the individual's disability itself. These problems can be remedied by changing social attitudes, physical environments, public policies, and other barriers to full participation. Steve, did you have, um, did I miss anything in that one? Well, one, yeah, you missed a whole lot. There's no <laughs> way that we can fit anything in. I would just suggest, but this is, this is a major concept that if you go to Google, you can spend hours and hours. I mean, I spend two whole classes on the medical model, but basically, yeah, attitudinal and physical barriers can be more disabling than than a disability itself um i mean where i live and work i have a wheelchair i have access to attendance uh i can go on and on but i mean if as long as i get somebody to do something that i can't which is get up out of bed and get dressed then baby i'm gone you know for 14 12, 14 hours a day, I'm gone by myself. I'm taking the train, I'm taking the bus, I'm going to, the, going to school. So, and one other personal I wanna make is that it, it, this, this cartoon is really funny, but people, but the disability community is not anti-medical people or, or I, I'm, I'm fine with being, treated as a patient when I am a patient, and that's when I'm at the hospital or when I'm at the doctor's office. But the problem is, is when I'm being treated as a patient in all other policy making decisions, when I'm being treated as a patient, when I'm, when I'm going to the bank or when I'm out on a date or, or when I'm applying for a job. So, I mean, Doctors and nurses are some of the best life-changing conversations I've ever had. It's with nurses and nurses' assistants. I, I have nothing, uh, nobody has anything against the medical community, except for when it creeps into policy making, so. Thanks, Steve. So um, we wanted to lay out these key concepts for you because they're very important pillars um, in the disability community. And um, it's important to have that kind of foundation before um, going forward and telling stories. So at this point in time, I'm going to, we're going to kind of flip the switch and Steve is going to um, introduce to you some um, kind of some history of how disability has been um, covered in um, the media. And it's off to you, Steve. Okay. Professor. So media, I mean, media has existed for hundreds of thousands of years. I, you know, the media was sitting around the campfire and having people tell stories. So but usually, I mean, for up until the 1970s or 80s, media such as liter the lit people with disabilities and literature, um, you could take a whole course on the role of disability in Shakespeare's plays. Uh, so we're, I want to kind of focus on the portrayal of disability in the past, say, 50 years of uh, television and film, and that's basically, there's basically one-dimensional characters are portrayed by people with disabilities, and they're what I call the dichotomy of disabilities. And the two major, the two major themes are either what, what we call in the disability community, the tiny Tim, who was, you know, if from the Dickens, um, from the from Dickens' story, uh, what, no, it's not a wonderful life. Anyway, it's the Dickens, it's the Dickens story and Tiny Tim is like this little crippled boy, right? And God blesses everyone. And so basically Tiny Tim serves as, as a symbol for people to 
will always be grateful, you know, and, and say, hey, you think he's, you've got problems? Look, a little tiny Tim. And why can't you be more like tiny Tim? He's got a whole lot of problems, but he's always smiling, okay? And he's always grateful. And, and the next uh, major theme is what we in the disability community call the super crip. The super crip is someone who defies their disability or overcomes their disability, such as the person who are the man who was blind, who recently climbed uh, Mount Everest or, or the double amputee that, that won the Olympics in racing. This person, uh, through their superhuman uh, 110%, efforts over overcome their disability so i just want to say that nobody has negative or envious feelings about the super crip if that's what you want to if you want to train if 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 that's what you want to do then that's fine you know i have no problem at all with that but the problem is is that through through people's uh, through people's through people's experience of disability, they start to expect that people with disabilities will always have fantastic attitudes, and they will always give a hundred and ten percent. The word is to overcome their disability. Well want to sit in the park and play a game of chess. Is that all right? But what is, what, one of the worst things a human, one human can do to another human is, is not be who they expected you to be or who they want you to be. And so if you do not fit into the category of either the, the grateful but pitiful tiny Tim or the 110% go-getting super crip, then you're going to not only disappoint them, you're, you're going uh, to like, you're going to destroy their unrealistic expectations of what you are and who you are. Okay. Well, that's, that's about all I have to say about that. And I just want to talk about the power of language. Of course, I heard uh, the writer Toni Morrison talk about when her and her sister were little girls, they would always try and write words on the sidewalk, and it was a word that they had never seen before, and they started writing F, and then they started writing U, and then before they got to see, their mom came screaming out and screaming at them. And Tom Morrison, you know, that's when she realized, gee, words are really, really powerful. You know, not only are words powerful, but words shape our reality, our, our perceived reality. So um, I just want you to consider the difference between these words between a disabled man and a person with a disability, confined to a wheelchair or uses the wheelchair, suffers from epilepsy or has epilepsy. So just think about that and we'll, um, Ms. Becker, or Ms. Becker will address that later on in this presentation. All right. Now I'm going to talk about disability throughout history, and, and just as I said, language is powerful and have a ornate, uh, have a need to organize and to have rational explanations. Well, how are you going to rationalize? How are you going to explain why someone's born deaf? Why someone's born blind? why someone has a limp, why someone has a hand that is smaller than the other hand. So basically all throughout history, 
throughout most of history, having a disability was a sign of evil or evil doing or the displeasure of the gods or either your parents' disability was a sign of evil, all right? And then after, say, the Enlightenment, after we started, started thinking more in rational terms, more in scientific terms, in, um, disability was still not, not a sign of evil, but it was a sign of a, of a moral failing. Uh, of overindulgence, you lost your hand because you got drunk on work at work, and uh, the unsafe working conditions amputated your arm, or uh, immorality. You know, you went blind because you were doing something immoral. Whatever it was, the role of society and the environment of of the society did not play a role in disability. It was always my, it was always a personal experience. It was always the fault of the person who has disability, who, who has the disability. And uh, further on, up until the, like the 20s came, came the eugenics movement where disability, it wasn't the sin of evil, it wasn't a mo immorality, but disability was actually a disease to the economic and political body of society, a disease that had to be eliminated, had to be, had to be cured, had to be overcome. So basically, you, a reaction to disability is the same fight or flight reaction that any organism has. We either look, we either try to eliminate disability through say infanticide, or we try to isolate. If we don't eliminate disability, we try to isolate it. And that's by putting people with disabilities in dungeons, in prisons and in asylums, and incarcerating them in nursing homes. And the one thing I wanna say is what's really pathetic is there was a whole whole lot of work done with people with mental health issues that, I mean, we, we basically warehouse people in the 1700s in their prisons. And basically, we're doing the same damn thing today. We're, most of the people, more than half of the people that are homeless out on the street have mental health issues. And it's just a vicious cycle from being homeless, to running into the police, to going into a prison. Not only is it a prison where you're isolated, but it's a prison where you don't receive the medication and the treatment you need. So you're released, released to what? Homelessness, and the whole program goes, to, and the whole cycle starts all over again. So we really haven't had, made a lot of progress in that area. So if you don't, if you can't eliminate disability or isolate disability, you denigrate disability. Because the root problem for negative perceptions of disability is fear and anxiety. So this is kind of like uh, the old phrase of whistling past the graveyard. You take people with disabilities and you shove them into freak shows, into asylum tours, or you give them, uh, char make them comical characters, such as uh, the, the character that couldn't see very well, Mr. Magoo, right? I mean, you know, you just laugh at disability. Well, that's never gonna happen to me, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm immune uh, to, becoming disabled or my children are immune. Okay, next slide, please. So now I want to just talk about, and this could be a whole, I'm going to talk about this for five minutes. This could be a whole semester long class about, as a matter of fact, it is a semester long class about depictions of disability just in film. But usually there's, there's three really main heroes and or three really main characters. 
separate caricatures, I say. And one is the hero who, who serves as an inspiration and through uh, his superhuman will or love of his family, uh, finally at the end of the movie, jumps out of his wheelchair and, and saves the day and saves the family dog or whatever. Somehow what he does is he overcomes his disability. Okay, the second main character is the villain, right? He's always, and it's usually somebody like Captain Hook, somebody who has a uh, a disability, a, a, a physical disability or deformity, like Quasimodo or Captain Hook, or miss, somebody missing an eye, right? And basically, the logic behind that is if you're deformed in body, you're also deformed, deformed in your mind. Um, the other, or and another uh, part of the villain is the manipulator, somebody with a disability who uses their disability to manipulate and control people. Uh, the best example would be the old film noir movie, Man with the Golden Arm, the woman who uh, fakes being in a wheelchair and she manipulates Frank Sinatra. Um, the next one, with the next character is the victim who basically um, is, is, is basically seen as le less by the audience. The audience says, well, you know, my life, my life might be bad, but at least I don't have it as bad as this person. Um, some other characters uh, in Hollywood are uh, what I really love. You can see this all throughout Hollywood. Is the is, is the person who uh, becomes disabled and is so noble and heroic that they want to commit suicide because they don't want to be a burden on their family or society. So this newly disabled person always has to list, enlist the aid of a non-disabled person to, to help them commit suicide. You know, that is that scene in the book, Other Side of the Mountain, Richard Dreyfuss, is, uh, whose life is it anyway, and most recently in the movie Pretty Baby with Clint Eastwood. And it's all, it's always the same story, you know. Oh, disability is such an absolute tragedy. I, I need you, non-disabled person, to help me commit suicide. The other, uh, another character, picture is the lovable uh, person with mental health issues that he's, he's a really nice guy, but also he's a danger to himself and society. And that can be seen in one of my favorite books and films of Mice and Men, of Lovely, of, of Lenny. Hey, George, oh, I can love him, I can squeeze him. Oh, but what does George do, his brother? He ends up killing him. Oh, it's all right to kill somebody with a disability. You're protecting society from disability. You're protecting your friend from having a disability. The very last, the very last character, uh, character I want to talk about is what I call the after-school special. A lot of the audience might be too young to under, know what after-school special is, but it was a, a little soap opera they would show after school, and about every third episode, there was always somebody that had a disability, and they were always doing uh, kind of having counterproductive feelings or and exhibiting counterproductive behaviors and basically what they needed was a non-disabled person to come in and give them a tough talk with tough love and tell them that they're being ungrateful and they're not appreciating what they have and you know they could have it worse and and they're ju they just don't have the right attitude. And then, you know, uh, 10 minutes before it ends, the disabled person's like, well, thank you very much for helping me, non-disabled person. Now that I know the error of my ways, you're right. I got, you're so right. Thank you for helping me. 
uh, you know, and I love life and everything, and everybody's all happy and crap like that. So that's basically that's basically my take on the depiction of disability in film. So I also want to talk about. I'm sorry. What was that? No, I, the next slide. Uh, I think. All right, I. Stuff. Yeah. Uh, this is, I just uh, this this is really funny. Do you guys know that there were nineteen non -dis, non disabled actors that received Academy Award nominations or or received Academy Awards? Nineteen actors that are non disabled for playing disabled people or disabled characters. The only disabled actor that played a disabled person was Marley Matlin way, way, way back in Children of a Lesser God. So, you know, my question is, well, I mean, it's obvious that it's unacceptable for a white person to play an African American, for a, a Caucasian to play an Asian. So, but, a lot of these rules, and you'll find throughout, just throughout any application in life, that a lot of the rules uh, apply to everybody except for disability. And that's, that's just really, that's just really interesting. You know, why is it all right for, why is it all right for somebody without a disability to play a disability? And for somebody, uh, but it's not a right for, say, a Caucasian to play an African-American. I would like to say that there has been some progress. If um, a SAG, what does SAG stand for? Like the Screen Actors Guild, they, they, they have a, a, a subsection for, uh, I think it's called Disabled uh, Artists. And if you ever need any information or any statistics, contact them and they keep statistics about uh, disabilities in Hollywood and who's playing what and how, what, what percentages are. Um, oh yeah, the only other thing is like, instead of me just uh, talking about negativity about Hollywood, a really great movie I would recommend and it's played by a person with a disability is the movie Margarita with a straw. It's a, actually it's a great movie about a coming of age, accepting disability, and it's uh, performed by the director's niece who has uh, cerebral palsy. So let's go on. So the pro problem. What is the problem? Well, the problem is that a person with a disability is individually is their individuality is denied. It's black or white. They, they basically pose a problem and it, the problem is having a disability and the answer to the problem is overcoming the disability. And the audience basically just sees disability through the, the lens of Hollywood and it reinforces uh, negative, it reinforces prejudice and negativity, ignorance and fear. And, and on top of that, not only the people in the audience, since uh, people with disabilities are 20% of our population, people with disabilities also take in these one account or one dimensional characters. And they, what we call, they internalize, they incorporate this perception of their disability into, into themselves. And they basically learn self-fulfilling prophecies. And they're basically, they limit themselves. I, uh, in my class, I, when I talk about internalization and limiting themselves, I always have a picture of an elephant with, tied to a stake with a string. And, and of course, that elephant can break away from that string. But I mean, when they were, they learned that from 
being a small, small, small baby elephant that they couldn't break away from the string. And so now they've internalized that as the string having power. And the only thing keeping the elephant from breaking away, it's itself. So that is how powerful these, you know, presentations in Hollywood can be. And this is what I love. This is when people have basically a one-dimensional concept of disability. They, be, they come to see people with disabilities as inspirations, as, as this is what the human spirit can achieve, right? And I'll just give you a couple uh, minutes just to look at what was, has been ripped from the, uh, from the headlines. This is called what we call inspiration porn or inspiration pornography and toxic positivity. And the reason why uh, the disability community chose the word inspiration pornography is not pornography as it has to do with sex, but it's inspiration pornography because well-meaning people will take people with disabilities and objectify them for their own personal gratification. Like they're not seeing them as individuals, they're seeing them as a monolithic, like a concept. And uh, toxic positivity is the same thing, is the same way. And I would really encourage you guys, there's a great YouTube presentation uh, called Inspiration Porn by a lady named Stella Young. And, talk, and there's also a great um, YouTube presentation by um, Jessica, and her last name escapes me. But I would really listen to that because, um, okay, because I, I, I think that being using people with disabilities as sources of inspiration or positivity really kind of hides, glosses over and hides a lot of problems and inaccessibilities and sources of discrimination that our society has. So I guess with that, Ms. Becker, I'll hand it over to you. Wow. Steve, thank you so much for all of that. It's, I find it absolutely fascinating, and I hope the audience um, does as well. There's clearly so much material to cover there. Um, I encourage everybody to continue to look for those examples um, of disability in media everywhere you go. Um, so now I am going to um, take you guys through, <clears throat> excuse me, um, my turn to talk and I can't. Um, so how to put this, what Steve said, into practice, okay? And we're going to go over some of the basic rules of reporting and storytelling when it comes to disability. Um, so basic rule number one disability and people who have disabilities are not monolithic or one-dimensional. So avoid referring to the disabled in the same way that you would not ref you would avoid referring to the Asians, the Jews, or the African Americans. Instead, consider using such terms as the disability community, um, the disability act activist, or just the person with a disability. Number two, Avoid sensationalizing. Um, avoid uh, adding emotional uh, descriptions like unfortunate, challenged, or pitiful. Avoid saying afflicted with, crippled, or victims of, or suffers from. These words um, portray individuals with disabilities as helpless or objects of pity and charity. Number three, use the word disability. Say the word. It is not a dirty word. And you want to really avoid all of these words altogether. 
challenged, handicapped, special, special needs, differently abled, or any of these types of phrases. These are condescending and paternalistic. And when referring to people without disabilities, please do not use the words able-bodied or normal, because really, what is the standard for normal anyway? Um, number five, report accurately. Um, a common mistake um, if you is um, using the term wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair. I mean, this is really kind of a, a legacy phrase that needs to really go away immediately um, because this is not at all accurate. Um, when a wheelchair is, uh, is, provides freedom and mobility and people get in and out of wheelchairs all of the time. Um, so it's, it's just a, not an accurate phrase. So um, basic rule number six, only include disability if it, is if it is a relevant part of the story. And when you do, report the disability as accurately as possible. Make sure that you have an accurate diagnosis and a source for that. Um, avoid generalizations, which uh, lead to increasing stigmas. And um, this really um, is prevalent um, when it comes to the mental health community because there are a lot of types of mental health issues and just generalizing um, leads, leads to increased stigmas. Um, and I want to recommend to anyone in the journalism profession, reporting, storytelling, anybody that wants help with this, um, to look at the National Center for Disability and Journalism. They have an APA style guide that is available online, um, and it's available in English and Spanish, but it's also available in print. And if you go to their website, um, they will mail you one for free. Um, and we'll have their website at the end of this presentation along with other resources. Uh, it has great um, recommendations um, and it's very, very comprehensive. It's like over 100 pages long. Um, number seven, do not equate disability with illness. I think we've talked about, we've covered this pretty extensively before. Um, people with disabilities can be very healthy, um, though they uh, have chronic conditions uh, and chronic diseases such as arthritis or heart disease or diabetes. Um, my condition um, is also um, it called Stargardt's disease, but I'm a pretty, I'm a very healthy person. Um, we, um, number eight, uh, do not to refer to a person with a disability as a patient, um, I guess, unless it is in reference to a medical story and they are re receiving treatment. Um, number nine, avoid stereotyping people with disabilities as heroes, inspirational, courageous, just because they have a disability. Um, rather, focus on a, a personal characteristic um, that aren't related to the disability, such as someone being an artist or a professional or a mother, things of that sort. Number 10, please avoid tear-jerking human interest stories about chronic diseases, congenital uh, disabilities, or significant, or significant injuries. Focus in, a better focus um, for your stories is instead on issues that affect the disability community um, and these the, these individuals' lives, um, stories about accessible housing and transportation, affordable health care, uh, employment opportunities, um, and discrimination and disability pride. So um, those are some basic rules that everybody can can follow and uh, in, and improve, um, you know, uh, media coverage and storytelling. So I want to say something really quickly about person first versus um, identity first language. Um, person first language um, puts the emphasis on the person first followed by the description of the disability. And some examples of this are a person who lives with a person who lives with a disability versus a disabled person, person uh, with an intellectual dis disability versus mentally disabled, or a person who is epileptic versus epileptic. Now, identity first language puts the emphasis on the disability. Um, 
a deaf man versus a man who is deaf. And several disability groups in the United States have always used identity first uh, terms, and specifically the culturally deaf and the, and the autis autistic rights community. Um, so that might be a little confusing to those who are unfamiliar. Um, and you might be wondering, well, how do I know, you know, which is the right, um, which is the right to choose? Um, and so how do you know is you should just ask. Now, personally, I do find that there are more, um, you know, we defer to the person first language. Um, so, but if you do get any pushback, I think it's important just to ask that question. And if you prefer um, identity first or person first language, and just knowing that there is a distinction and knowing that those are the terms that cover both of those groups is, is a huge step forward. So, I think at this point in time, we are at a time at a point where we have some might have some questions. Yes, we do have a few questions uh, that have come in on the chat and we have your pre asked questions from registration. Um, we are going to move through these quickly so we won't have time to cover every question in either space. Uh, but I do want to encourage you to sign up for our newsletters where the remainder of your questions will be answered in the future in some sort of content form. Uh, a lot of great questions here today. I want to go to the chat box and I want to ask um, a fun question. <laughs> That's our youngest dark law fan, Olivia, in the background. My apologies. Um, but do you have any examples of movies or TV shows you've come across where you've appreciated the depiction of people with disabilities, Lori or Steve? Steve, you're the... Um, well, like I just said, the, the movie um, Margarita with the Straw, there is, uh, of course, that t television show Play, where uh, it's, it's really kind of interesting because they have one non-disabled actor playing a disabled actor, a gentleman in a wheelchair, but they do have a disabled actress playing a character. So I think I think it is getting better. But actually right now the percentage of people of disabled actors being employed is less than than it was in the nineteen nineties. Mm -hmm. But I I can uh, you can always like Google up uh, disabled actors and find out who they are and what films they're they're coming in. But that comes to my mind right now is yeah. just what the one disabled actor is, Margarita with the Straw. So I always liked um, The West Wing was one of my favorite shows and there was um, a a woman, a female uh, character who was a lobbyist who was deaf. And was that, who, I can't, Steve, do you remember that? Who no. played, was that, anyway, but uh, um, anyway, that, that, I thought that was always a great, that she had, a, she was a great character. Yeah. I don't watch a lot of TV anymore. Perfect. Um, yeah. I do, I want to go to one of these pre-submitted questions. Uh, why do we continue to be so clumsy and awkward when it comes to approaching and writing about persons with disabilities? Mm -hmm. I would love to um, start with that one. Um, I think it is because unless you work alongside someone um, who has a disability or you have somebody in your family um, or you have a friend, um, then, you know, it will continue to be kind of awkward and uncomfortable. Um, and it, not enough people are, um, you know, we don't have enough people employed still. We don't have enough people in mainstream uh, workplaces. Um, we, we don't have enough um, positive representation in, in media. Um, and we're better than where we were before, but we're not far enough. And so uh, I think it is um, just that level of spending time with people with disabilities. And that is where, where we're at right now. But it is getting better. It is getting better. I think we might have time for just one more quick question. 
Um, I want to go back to our chat. Let me pull that up really quickly. Mm -hmm. Very sorry. Uh, this question is, can you coach us on how um, you are so inspirational, does not feel respectful, and how people are not intending to be hurtful? How can those words be redirected? So to rephrase the question, how do we redirect people who feel that people with disabilities are inspirational? Yeah, that's a great question because the thing is, nobody, when, nobody except for the most naughtiest person wakes up saying, ooh, I hate blind people or those deaf people are stealing my jobs or get those wheelchairs out of this country. I mean, usually I always find that people will, very well-meaning people will approach you and, and, and basically because they've been programmed to think about disability in one way or the other. And I can't tell you how many people have come up and said, I've always wanted to meet you. Um, I met one guy in the bar and he's like, I always want to meet you because you always roll in here and you always got a joke and blah, blah, blah. If I was you, I blow my brains out, you know? And, I, and people always ask, did you get really offended? And it's like, well, no, not really, because this guy is, He's trying to be nice to me. He came up to me and, and he, uh, you know, he, he, he just doesn't really realize, he thought he was paying me a compliment and really kind of insulting me. And I talk to my, my students and I say, always, always use this as an opportunity, as an educational opportunity. And even if you are offended and even if they said something really offensive, they probably have been programmed to look at you in a certain way. And it's take this opportunity to talk to them and tell them how this makes you feel. And, and more importantly, why it make what you just said to me, why that makes me feel the way I feel. But, you know, just, just saying something snarky back doesn't help either, either person. Right. Steve, I, I would like to add to that as well. I mean, I still get, you know, comments from, you know, like, you know, just people on Facebook and things like that and say, oh, you know, you're inspirational and things like that. And the way it makes me feel is that, um, that that's a burden to carry. Like, that's, I don't want to feel like I have to be um, your hero or your you know an inspiration to you and um because then i what happens when i let you down and that's really uh, that's an unfair heavy burden to put on people um and i i heard that echoed really recently from some um, leaders in the healthcare industry when they were talking about healthcare heroes and uh, some folks were saying you know please stop calling us that we're just normal people trying to do our jobs and calling us that is adding weight you know um so please you know we appreciate the sentiment but you know stop trying to to put that on us and um it you're you're you know putting that pressure on us that we don't need right now and we're just trying to live our lives so I think that might be a, a respectful way to redirect those comments. Perfect. Um, I want to go over to the next slide where Lori will just go over some really actionable next steps we can start putting into practice today. Oh, I, I am. Are, Dallas, I, oh, can, I can I can do that. Um, so I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, some actionable next steps of what you can do today is, you know, follow the basic rules we covered today. I see a lot of people asking about the um, National Center for Disabled Journalists APA Style Guide. You can find that um, in the email that we will send out. Um, following this presentation, we will put all of the links to the resources that you'll see on the next slide as well. Um, know why the rules that we covered matter today. 
tell the stories that matter to the disability community. We will also have a numerous amount of um, media opportunities that you can cover, including some of our events that we are putting on for the rest of the month to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the ADA and Disability Pride Month. Include people with disabilities in your organization. Recruit and hire a person with a disability. Um, our favorite slogan is nothing about us without us. Find opportunities to raise awareness about disability issues in the disability community. There are many opportunities and spokespeople. And if you ever need or want advice, ask. People would much rather be asked than for you to be in a state where you might inadvertently offend someone and not take the courage to ask. Um, you're learning something new and learning sometimes means you just have to ask. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, these are the additional resources I will be sure to include in the email that is sent over to you. And in our next slide, you'll see that there are plenty of media opportunities to cover this, um, this year, every year. Um, we're always available for you to come to us and we have probably already got something lined up for you to cover. Um, next slide, please. And as I stated before, we have a, a myriad of campaign events to help us celebrate that diversity includes disability, including our next event that is coming up next Thursday at one o'clock featuring Dr. Donna Walton and Janet Labreck, where we will be um, talking about the intersection of race and disability with Black Disabled Lives Matter Part One, a national outlook from thought leaders. Uh, we'll follow that up the following week, and then we will end the uh, celebratory month with a concert and conversation with Galen Lee. Uh, visit our website for uh, next steps to sign our pledge, get a sticker, register for these events. Uh, and um, I just want to thank everybody for coming today. Thank you for sticking in with us. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook to stay connected with us. And Stay safe, stay well, stay healthy. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dallas. Thank you, everyone. Take care.